OK, in this video, I'm going to be briefly discussing the question of whether or not God can be trusted in the face of certain kinds of evils. Uh, here I mean evils that are apparently or supposedly gratuitous, but the real categories are the categories of the evils striking us as being particularly horrendous or even destructive. And this is a different take on the problem of evil than what is traditionally found in the literature. So traditional approaches to the problem of evil focus on whether or not belief in God is rendered um, unreasonable or irrational given the nature of the existence of certain kinds of evils in the world or just the existence of evil simpliciter, um, whether or not atheism is more likely than not given the existence of evil or certain kinds of evils, whether God's existence is at all compatible with the existence of certain kinds of evils and the like. Um, my take on this is more, even if the existence of certain kinds of evils doesn't justify us in being an atheist, um, it may justify us in being an apostate. And by an apostate, I mean an individual who either abandons their trust in God um, or initially refuses to exercise trust in God. So um, apostasy is consistent with believing that there could be such a being as God, but just refusing to be in any kind of relationship with this being, refusing to trust this being, refusing to orientate one's life around the existence of such a being, and so on and so forth. So this is a completely different kind of take on the problem of evil. Now, and what I want to point out here is that even if there are no actually existing gratuitous, horrendous, or destructive evils, um, whether or not these kinds of evils actually exist has nothing to do with whether the our experience of certain kinds of, of evil strikes us in that kind of way. So in an instance of evil that you experience may strike you as gratuitous, or it may appear to you to be gratuitous, even if it's not actually gratuitous. And as I'll say, given that um, an, an experience of evil can strike us as being horrendous or destructive in a certain kind of way, even if it's not actually gratuitous, um, this is why I don't think that a skeptical theist position is really going to help all of that much, or at the very least, skeptical theism may not be enough to get God off of the hook. Okay, so just some, um, for some simple uh, components of what it means to trust another individual or, or what's important to trust. Okay, and this isn't working, so let me try again. There we go. All right, so trust involves epistemic, emotional, and volitional components. So to believe that a, a given individual is trustworthy um, is not only to have beliefs about this individual's capacities, so trusting that an individual will perform a certain action on your behalf, so you can trust an individual to do something or to refrain from doing something, but trust also involves some kind of confidence in this being's moral character. So not only can I trust you to perform an action on my behalf or refrain from performing a certain kind of action, but I also trust that you're the kind of being um, that I can have confidence to act in this kind of way. So there's a difference between trusting an individual to do something, meaning in terms of they have the actual capacity to do it, and trusting that they are the kind of being of appropriate character to do something like this. So as Annette Baer says, um, trust involves a confident expectation that the one being trusted will respond directly and favorably to the thought that the truster is counting on them. Okay, so this is why um, trust opens us up to that kind of vulnerability. Um, trust takes time to cultivate over time, but it, it makes us particularly vulnerable because you can always sort of demand more evidence that somebody prove they're trustworthy, right? And demanding more evidence to prove that somebody is trustworthy, that can be incredibly overbearing to the individual. So this is why entering into a trusting relationship is going to in involve a kind of volitional component. I mean, call it a leap of faith if you want. Um, I need to make a decision 
in a trusting relationship about whether or not I have been given enough opportunity to exercise trust or whether or not I have been given enough evidence that the individual can be trusted to perform a certain kind of action or to treat me in certain kinds of ways and that they are, and that I have adequate evidence that they are a being of a certain kind of character which can actually be trusted. So even though we can always demand more evidence, um, so there's, there's no magic number in terms of evidence or confidence that you need to have to trust another individual, um, we are ca also capable of recognizing when trust can be misguided. So um, if the barista at the coffee shop hands me the coffee that I ordered and they say, I, I promise I didn't spit in your coffee, I'm going to take them at their word, even though my experience with this individual is incredibly minimal. You know, I, I trust that you didn't spit in my coffee simply on the basis of you saying that you didn't spit in my coffee. But man, um, when my kids are of the age where they are starting to be sort of romantically involved with other individuals and things like that, you know, if, if you want to be a spouse to one of my children or you want to be partnered with one of my children, you, you're going to, it's going to require a lot more evidence for, you know, me to trust you in, in that kind of way. I mean, in one sense, it seems that the stakes are higher, but epistemically or evidentially, that is a completely different kind of situation here. Okay, so what does it mean to trust God? So trusting God um, involves trust that God is a being that's capable, has the power of acting on your behalf, but also that God is a being of a certain kind of character. God is the kind of being that um, has our best interests in mind. God is a being that loves us, cares for us, um, God is a being that can be a source of strength in times of trouble, so on and so forth. Okay, now, and the distinction that I make, one of the important distinctions that I make in the paper is the difference between um, abandoning or initially refusing to trust God and simply lacking the will to trust God. I'll get to that momentarily. Um, but an individual who abandons their trust in God or initially refuses to trust God may do so because they actually are questioning God's character. They're actually not sure if God is a being that is either capable of acting on their behalf or whether God is a being of loving or caring or compassionate kind of character, which can actually be trusted to act on their behalf. Um, or the person might abandon their trust in God or initially refuse to trust God simply on the basis of saying, hey, I, I don't have enough evidence to, um, you know, to choose one way or the other uh, about whether God is actually a being of trustworthy character or not. Okay, now, but the distinction I want to make is the difference between abandoning trust uh, or initially refusing to trust God and simply lacking an appropriate will to trust God. Um, and this is the case in other kinds of trusting relationships as well. An individual may desire to trust with all of their heart or may want to trust with everything within them, but due to past trauma or past harm, they are just incapable of exercising trust. So somebody who has been betrayed by people in the past might have trouble trusting individuals in the future. And even if they strongly desire with all of their heart to trust another individual, they may lack the requisite power or strength of will to do that simply because of psychological, emotional, spiritual, religious kind of trauma or other, they're, you know, they're still healing from other kinds of harms and things like this. So I want to trust you, but I can't trust you. Um, that is a different kind of state of affairs than the state of affairs that I am talking about here. Okay, now what about trust and its relationship to certain kinds of evil, specifically um, when it comes to trust in God? All right, so suppose we have an individual S who experiences a supposedly gratuitous, horrendous, or destructive evil. And the example I use in the paper is the um, sudden and unexpected loss of a child, okay? So it's supposedly gratuitous or apparently gratuitous, meaning that upon reflection, S has no reason to believe that God's failing to prevent this instance of evil 
was necessary to avoid sacrificing anything of greater moral worth, nor was it necessary to prevent something equally bad or worse. So the individual need not say it's actually gratuitous. The individual just needs to say, well, I so from where I stand, I have no reason to believe it's not actually gratuitous. I, I have no good reason to believe that God had to allow this to happen um, in order to uh, accomplish some greater good, good or avoid something equally bad or worse. So keep in mind here, we're talking about S's loss, unexpected loss of their child. Okay. So if S were to suddenly and unexpectedly lose their child, it would be apparently or supposedly gratuitous to them if upon reflection, they would say, well, I have no reason to think that the loss of my child was necessary for some greater good. I have no reason to think that God could, couldn't could have prevented it without failing to prevent something equally bad or worse, whatever the case may be. Um, now, the experience of the loss of their child being apparently horrendous or striking them as horrendous means that upon consideration of the loss of their child, um, S's life may not be worth living upon reflection. You know, the, the, the loss of their child may be such a tremendous loss to them that they may not see their continued life as being worth it based on the loss of their child. Um, the experience of this evil would be particularly destructive if it's existentially destabilizing. It shakes S to the very core of their being. Um, it transforms them in a apparent in a in an incredibly negative kind of way. They're not the same person as they were before. And anybody who has children um, can anticipate that the sudden and unexpected loss of their child would be particularly destructive in this kind of way. All right, now, but suppose with respect to S and past instances where S has trusted God, um, suppose it is true of S that she initially places her trust in God um, and throughout her life has had a clear sense that God loves her, that God cares for her. Um, she believes that God is a being that has had her best interest in mind in the past and so on and so forth. Um, she can look at past instances of, of her life of God coming through for her or God being on her team. Um, and she wholly believes that with all her heart. But suppose it's also the case that S has an interest in continuing in a trusting relationship with God. And S believes that this sentiment is also reciprocated by God. So S is interested in continuing in a trusting relationship with God, and S also believes that God reciprocate, reciprocates this interest of, of continuing in a trusting relationship with her. So it's, it's this kind of basis for experiencing a supposedly or apparently gratuitous evil which strikes you as horrendous or destructive that I have in mind here. So um, we have this, S has this sort of background case, if you will, you know, these, these background beliefs about God and instances in her life where she chose to trust God and, and felt that God responded to her trust approvingly and, and directly. So, and she's, this worked in cultivating her trust and so on and so forth. All right. So, and here's where the heart of it is. Okay. So suppose all of this, these things are true of S. So suppose that S trusts God to perform A, and what would action A be with respect to the sudden and unexpected loss of her child? Um, S may not directly wake up every day and pray that, you know, God, I trust that you're not going to take my child away from me. But, but suppose S at least indirectly trusts God for that. So, and I don't mean that S believes that she can act negligently towards her children. So this was an objection that somebody raised when I presented this paper once. So, so if I trust that God will not take my child away from me, is, can I leave my children at home, you know, unattended to because I trust that God will providentially care for them? No, that's not what I mean. I mean, um, I, I trust that God is not going to allow my children to be kidnapped, tortured, and murdered, something like that, right? So through no, no negligence of S's own there's an unexpected and sudden loss of her child, which isn't the result of any negligence um, from her with respect to her child. So she trusts that God is going to providentially care for her child. Call that A. So S trusts God to perform action A. And let's, let's say it's true that God actually is a being of capacity. God actually has the power 
to perform A on behalf of S. God actually has the power to providentially care for S's child um, on S's behalf and uh, also on the child's behalf. And suppose it's also true that to S, God's failure to perform A, God's failure to providentially care for her child would be an apparently gratuitous, horrendous, uh, destructive instance of evil. And God also knows that S is trusting God to perform A, right? Now, suppose it's also true that God knows that their failure to perform A on S's behalf will strike S as apparently gratuitous, horrendous, or destructive instance of evil. So God knows that failing to perform A on S's behalf will have that kind of impact um, on S. And this is where skeptical theism comes in. God also knows that even if God has a morally sufficient reason for allowing A to occur, for failing or I'm sorry, not for allowing A to occur, for failing to perform A on S's behalf, that S is not in a reasonable epistemic situation to see whatever that morally sufficient reason is. So God knows on the truth of skeptical theism that skeptical theism is actually true. So God knows God's reasons for allowing certain kinds of evils to befall us, but God knows that we don't have the right kind of epistemic capacity to understand or appreciate or, or even, even reasonably conceive about what those reasons are. So God allows those evils to occur, which are going to strike us as gratuitous, which are going to strike us as being horrendous and are going to have that kind of destructive existential impact on us. God allows those things to occur knowing full well that it's not within our power to see that those things are not actually gratuitous um, to see the bigger plan here, to contemplate God's reasons, and so on and so forth. So even if God has pl a plan, even if God has their reasons, God knows that we don't have access to those reasons, and God knows that um, our failure to understand those reasons will strike us, you know, as being destructive and horrendous and those kinds of things. And suppose God also knows that if God fails to perform A on S's behalf, that S will likely feel a strong sense of being betrayed God, by God. God, or that uh, S will feel like a fool for trusting God, um, or at the very least that S's confidence that God can be trusted or S's trust in God will likely be diminished, eroded, or even destroyed, okay? Okay, now, but here's the problem. If God intends certain goods for S, such as freely drawing S into a relationship or to be intimately um, uh, united with her, allowing certain evils to befall S that will likely erode S's trust in God is a very peculiar way to accomplish this goal. Um, especially when S's placing her trust in God is instrumental or necessary for attaining those goods that God intends for her in the first place. So here's the problem. If God knows that S has no rational capacity to see that this is not actually gratuitous or that this is actually instrumental or necessary for some greater good, to the extent that trusting God is necessary for attaining the goods that God intends for her, if trusting God is necessary for the attainment of those goods, then God shouldn't act in ways towards us that would undermine our trust. So if, if trusting God is necessary for enjoying certain goods that God intends for us, then God acting in ways towards us or failing to act in ways towards us that can potentially undermine our trust or destroy our trust or erode our trust, that would be a really peculiar way um, for God to act on our behalf or fail to act on our behalf. So under those circumstances, then, it seems that nobody can blame S for abandoning her trust in God or initially refusing to trust God under those kinds of circumstances, including God themselves. Here's my point. So to, to take it from sort of a God's eye perspective, if God says to us, hey, I have certain goods intended for you and for the whole created order, and attaining those goods is going to require that you trust me. Like, those goods cannot be attained without your trust. Well, God then shouldn't do anything which would make it incredibly difficult, if not impossible, for us to trust them. But if 
a strong feeling of being betrayed by God or uh, a strong feeling of it being feeling like a fool for trusting God under these kinds of circumstances. If allowing apparently gratuitous or horrendous or destructive evils to occur, knowing full well that we can't see the bigger picture here, will undermine our trust in God, then to the extent that trust is necessary for attaining those kinds of goods, if God wants those goods to be attained, then God shouldn't allow apparently gratuitous, horrendous, or destructive evils to happen to us. But if God is going to undermine my trust, and yet trusting God is necessary for the attainment of certain kinds of goods, I can't be blamed for failing to trust God. I can't be blamed for failing to attain those goods in my life to the extent that God makes it rather difficult for me to actually engage in a trusting relationship with them. That, that's the main idea here. So if, if God knows that I can't see the bigger picture, and yet God allows certain evils to occur that will undermine my trust in them, I can't be blamed properly. I can't be blamed properly for failing to trust God, refusing to trust God, or abandoning my trust in God. That's the point. Okay, now what are some potential responses here? Okay, so it could be this. It could be that it was not S's place to trust God to perform A on her behalf in the first place. So um, not everything that we trust God for potentially is the kind of thing that it is our place or our business to trust God for in the first place. So I can't trust God to provide me with a winning lottery ticket. I, I, I can't try out for the Chicago Bears and say, God, I'm trusting that I'll make the team and I'll get a multi-million dollar, multi-year contract, even though I haven't played football since junior high. You know, So I trust that God is gonna get me a winning lottery ticket. I go buy a lottery ticket, it's a losing lottery ticket, and I get all pissed off at God that I didn't win the lottery. Yeah, that seems petulant. That, that seems to be the kind of thing that it's not with, it's not my right or my place, or it's not my business to trust God for that. But given the importance that S's child has to her, if S cannot trust God to not deprive them of their child, if, if this is an, an area of special interest and concern to S, I would say, you know, the love that one hands for their child, that the one that love has for their child, this is one of the most important areas of concern that one could possibly have. Um, if I can't trust God to not deprive me of my children, if, I, if it's not my business to trust God with that, I have no idea what I can trust God for then. If I cannot trust God to not allow my children to be kidnapped, tortured, and murdered, if I can't trust God for that, given the fact that that is a, a tremendous area of ultimate concern for me, I have no idea what I could possibly trust God for then. I mean, so think of S who just lost their child. Well, if I can't trust that you're not going to deprive me of my children, what the hell can I trust you for, God? What, you know, you, you say you're on my side. Well, someone who's on my side wouldn't deprive my children of me. That, that's the problem here. So to say that it's not S's business or it's not S's place to trust God with that. Well, what is it within S's place to trust God for? So if S can't trust God with that, it doesn't seem abundantly clear what S can actually trust God for. Now, it could be this. It could also be that God's primary concern is not primarily with S's good in particular, but just with the good of the cosmos as a whole. So it's not that S is per, or, or I'm sorry, it's not that God is particularly interested in cultivating a trusting relationship with S or continuing in a trusting relationship with S, but God has a, a greater plan, if you will, of which S is a part, but of which S is good and S is well-being is not God's kind of primary concern. Now, so even if the death of S's child is necessary to accomplish some greater good, some greater plan that God has for the cosmos, well, that doesn't mean that S needs to just stand idly by and just lump it, just say, oh, well, it's part of some greater good. No, if, if S is being used as a means to an end, then it certainly seems that S has grounds to protest here. Okay, and to the extent that S believes that God is interested 
in continuing or reciprocating a trusting relationship with them. Well, if S has reason to believe that, oh, no, I'm just being used as a means to an end so that God can accomplish some greater good, which largely has nothing to do with me, then S has grounds to say, oh, well, God isn't interested in reciprocating a trusting relationship with me. So, okay, well, if God doesn't want to have anything to do with me, then I don't want to have anything to do with God. The, the idea that the death of S's child is necessary for some greater good, even if that is true, that the death of S's child and, you know, the death of S's child in a particularly horrendous kind of fashion that's unexpected and, and existentially destructive to S, even if that's true that it's necessary for some greater good, if it's not a greater good that affects S or it's not a greater good that concerns S, no reasonable person, including God, can just expect S to throw their hands in the air and say serenity now and just accept it. No, S has grounds to protest that God is using them as a means to an end, that God has no interest in cultivating or reciprocating a trusting relationship with them, and S can then be justified in abandoning or refusing to trust God or become apostate under those kinds of circumstances. Okay, now some other kinds of concerns here about how to potentially move forward. Um, the first thing to take into consideration here is that trust and trusting relationships are not static arrangements, they're dynamic arrangements. Um, Trust needs to be continually cultivating. Cho cultivated. Choosing to enter into a trusting relationship is not a one and done kind of scenario. I, I need to wake up every morning and choose to trust. Based on past evidence, some days trusting may require a bigger leap of faith than other days and so on and so forth. So choosing to trust another individual that's not a permanent decision but also refusing to trust or abandoning trust that is also not a permanent decision okay so s herself may come to a place where her trust in god is actually renewed or where she actually no longer protests god or even forgives god for the evil that has befallen her um if God exists, I, I think there are certain kinds of things that God is going to have to ask our forgiveness for, for, for those instances of evil, for using us as a means to an end, um, whatever the case may be. So the idea that S may come to a place where she actually forgives God, and, and what does it mean to forgive? To forgive God would be to no longer hold something against God. So S's trust in God may actually be renewed at some future time. But if S severs the relationship or S says, you know what, God, I don't want to have anything to do with you right now. I, I protest you. I, 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 I consider myself, your, may even go so far as to consider themselves an enemy of God for a point in time, or at the very least, not going to necessarily be on good speaking terms with God for a while, not consider God a friend, not consider God a source of strength and comfort, those kinds of things. That it may happen in the future where S forgives God and chooses to freely trust God again, you know, where their, their trust in God might actually be renewed. That's a possibility. Okay, now the, also, the other thing we need to take into consideration here is that there are circumstances where individuals' trust in God is actually strengthened in the face of such evils. I mean, I know individuals who have lost children who that didn't destroy the trust they had for God, that actually strengthened it. They, they actually ran towards God rather than away for God. I'm, I'm not diminishing that, and I don't mean to diminish that. Now, since trust is not solely an epistemic concern, it's not a surprise that, you know, individuals' faith or their trust in God is actually strengthened in the face of those kinds of evils. But it doesn't always turn out that way. Now, but if the individual who is protesting God or the individual who chooses not to trust God um, has no epistemic grounds to say, you know what, you are a fool for trusting God in, in that kind of circumstance. If, if God takes your child away from you and it absolutely destroys you, you are a fool for not severing the relationship with God under those kinds of circumstances. That seems to be too strong of a claim. So here's an analogous case. Um, 
if if two individuals are in a committed monogamous um you know uh exclusive kind of relationship and one partner engages in an act of infidelity against the other partner if the partner who was cheated on chooses to remain in that relationship and work it out it doesn't seem that anybody has grounds to say well you're a fool for choosing to stay in that kind of relationship but it also seems that an individual can't say that's what you ought to do. It, it, you ought to stay in the relationship or you ought to abandon the relationship. It, it doesn't seem that any independent party has grounds to say what this individual should do. Now, take that approach here in understanding what it means to be in a trusting relationship with God. If you experience an apparently gratuitous or hor horrendous instance of evil, which makes you think that your life on the whole is not worth living or it's particularly destructive or existentially dis destabilizing, and you choose to abandon your faith, you choose to no longer trust God, you choose to protest God and no longer consider yourself a friend to God, I don't think anybody is, is in a position to blame you for that. So I think it cuts both ways. If I don't have the grounds to tell you, you need to curse God and die, you, you, know, you need to tell God to fuck off. I, if, if I don't have grounds to tell you to abandon your faith, I don't think you have grounds to tell me I shouldn't abandon my faith. I think it cuts both ways. So if no party can tell the other party what they ought to do under those kinds of circumstances, if I don't have grounds to tell you, you need to remain in a trusting relationship with God, um, I don't think you have grounds to tell me or any other person uh, the same thing. You know, you're wrong for abandoning your trust in God. Uh, if I can't tell you what to do in the face of those kinds of evils, if I can't blame you for not abandoning your trust in God, I don't think you can blame anybody for abandoning their trust in God. And, and I think that includes God. So to the extent that cultivating a relationship with God requires us to trust God to the extent that God is interested in being a relationship with us, then God ought not act ways towards us or fail to act in ways to, towards us that might potentially undermine our trust, um, diminish our trust, destroy our trust, so on and so forth. Now, but if certain kinds of experiences of evil cause us or as a result of those kinds of things, we do initially refuse to trust God or abandon our trust in God. Um, I don't think individuals in those kinds of circumstances can appropriately be blamed for abandoning trust, refusing to trust, um, or abandoning their trust, or, or just engaging in a form of protest against God under those kinds of circumstances, right? Okay, so I know it's a complicated argument and there's more that can be said, but for now, that is all that will be said. All right. And I got through this without crying. So that's a good sign, at least. All right, everyone. Thanks a lot.